all the four authors are here. I'm not necessarily in this room right now, but hopefully that happens. Um, <coughs> so let me start with some definition. And as you see here, a commentorial is coming out of the closet. But I like definitions. So um, uh, two local Hamiltonians. Well, all of you know, um, like a local Hamiltonian is um, well, a Hamiltonian and self-adjoint matrix. In that case, acting on the tensor product of the uh, local spaces. These are like small constant dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces. And so, actually, and so, um, yeah, here we go. So, so a local interaction, well, it is, um, well, when we represent it, it's just a, a, a matrix acting on these two, uh, the tensor product of these two small dimensional spaces. But then, and that's what I call H prime ij, but then, of course, we are taking the tensor product of this operator with the identities on the rest, and this way we get the H ij. So I just make this slight distinction um, because uh, just to uh, avoid any misunderstanding. And <clears throat> of course, it does not matter whether we talk about the H prime or the H, they have the same norm. And so the operator norm is the strength of this interaction. And so now, our Hamiltonian, which is a linear operator acting on this big tensor space, I mean, in this big tensor product space, is just the sum of these local interactions. And from now on, I will just assume that each HIJ is positive uh, semi-definite. So, um, so as such, like when uh, I compute the um, well, the phi HIJ phi star, then uh, so that's going to be non-negative. So this sum is called the energy that, um, and that is created uh, by this Hamiltonian on state phi. So uh, when we are looking for the ground space, or the ground state, we are trying to find the phi which minimizes this energy. So the, uh, so the state phi picks up some energy from every interaction, they are all non-negative, and our goal is to minimize that. So, uh, um, well, that's so we have heard uh, in many talks that that's actually that's a hard task, and so we are not. So, if if we just try to look at this huge exponential size matrix. Uh, what did I do? Uh, this huge exponential size matrix that it won't tell us much. Like, uh, <coughs> it won't give us um, any clue, usually, ni neither about how uh, this minimizing so called ground state looks like, nor, um, like, you nor know, be able to find it. So, we are trying to find a structure to the ground state. And actually, physicists, of course, since and I, I am not um, an expert at that, but so they were looking um, a lot at uh, this problem. And what they noticed that many uh, Hamiltonians have so called gap, which is that, well, the ground energy, which is just the eigenvalue associated with the ground state, and then the, like the other eigenvalue, which the next smallest, the next smallest um, 
uh, eigenvector with maximized eigenvalue. So they are like actually they are gaps. So they look more like this than this. So there are of course degrees to how gapped the Hamiltonian is. Well, sometimes we can just say or we want to say that the ground state is unique. Uh, sometimes actually there is a gap which is, well, thinking of n as going to infinity, it's polynomial or inverse polynomial in n or sometimes actually it's constant. Now, constant with respect to what? Well, if the interaction strengths are constant, think of it, one, then so the get Hamiltonian has, well, get also a constant. Now, I just want to mention that, of course, the gap cannot be larger than the strengths of the smallest strength term. So uh, that's the largest gap that we can think of. So when I say gapped Hamiltonian, then from now on, I always mean that the gap is omega 1. Okay, so that was gapped Hamiltonian and the <coughs> definitions. And uh, in order to um, uh, be able to state theorems, I need another concept, which is entanglement entropy. So entanglement entropy, and then this has been uh, talked before, uh, so entanglement entropy is a measure, is a, is a number which measures the entanglement between uh, uh, two subsystems of a system. So namely, if the Hilbert space is a tensor product of two other Hilbert spaces, and this state is living in the tensor product Hilbert space, then it measures how uh, much the part of phi uh, which lies in A has to do with the part of phi which lies in B. And, <clears throat> well, we can measure it in many different ways. One way of measuring it is tracing out uh, the system A from phi, which gives us a reduced density matrix on B. And then we can just look at the von Neumann entropy of uh, this. Of, the, of this reduced density matrix. Alternatively, we can do it in the other way around, but that just turns out to be the same thing. And even alternatively, we can just look at the Schmidt coefficients of this space, of this state, and just uh, form this very familiar expression, which is, of course, an entropy expression. And again, you get the same, but this is no magic. This is very simple mathematics. Simply, uh, it relies on the fact that the eigenvalues of A, A star is, are the same as the eigenvalues of A star A, except the zeros. Um, so um, now I have all the concepts I need. So let me... Um, now go a step further. And um, of course, I am not telling you novelty, because there was this wonderful talk of Zeff, which already explained the area law conjecture. Um, but let me just spend a minute on it. So um, the area law says that if you have a local Hamiltonian acting on this tensor product space, namely, well, the product of all the locales. But now I am clumping together those that are inside a region, and I am clumping those components together that are outside a region, that I can ask, like, what is the entanglement that going across the boundary? And... Um, 
So the conjecture is that that entanglement is upper bounded by something. Namely, that something is just you count the number of interactions that connect the inside system and the outside system together. Well, graph theoretically, this is just the, the I mean, what I'm counting is the, is the size of this. I, I, I mean, so, so what I'm looking at is the size of this cut. And, um, and so the, the area law conjecture is that the entanglement entropy between these two subsystems is actually upper bounded by the size of the cut. And here, this notation just means that it's within a constant factor. And the k means that, well, k is the dimension of this grid, because um, uh, so we can look at one, like just a line, or like this kind of thing, or a three-dimensional grid. And um, <clears throat> so uh, the, there could be some dependence on the dimension. But basically, it's the size of the cut. And actually, notice that um, that whatever dimension I am looking at, the area law always says the same. That is the size of the cut. Um, OK, so let's go one step further. And so uh, the area law, well, is a theorem for physicists, maybe, but um, uh, even uh, uh, maybe not so, because after all, Hastings was a physicist who felt that it needs some proof. And he did like a marvelous, um, he, uh, like he, he had a beautiful proof. Um, I heard it was beautiful. I did not read it, but I am planning to. <laughs> I, I am planning to read it. I, I really do because because I heard that like it has a lot of intuition um, about like Lee Robinson uh, <coughs> uses Lee Robinson bonds and so forth. So it's it's a very inspired paper, and it actually and and he proved the area law for one D systems. And um, so it inspired, indeed, like a, a sequence of other papers. And I just mentioned um, like some important papers here, like Dorit Aharon of uh, Itai Arad, Zef Landau, and Umesh Vazirani had a new combinatorial approach. Um, and they just reproved like Hastings theorem in with that combinatorial approach. Actually, this approach turned out to be, well, not just a reproof. Actually, they did not even completely reproof at that time, because they just talked about frustration-free Hamiltonians, that is, when the ground energy is 0, as opposed to like arbitrary Hamiltonians. And since we are talking about positive operators, like 0, is the ground energy, I mean, zero is as low as it can get. So uh, that's why it's called frustration free. So, um, so um, but in the subsequent papers, it's not just that there, there was, so they, so they made substantial improvement over uh, Hastings in terms of well, d is the dimension of the locale. So it's still a constant. Well, you might view it as a constant, or you might not. Um, and so epsilon is the gap. So here is the improved formula. You see there is an exponential improvement in terms of these. Of course, if you consider both constants, and you can sweep it under the rug, but, but you don't want to, and that's a beautiful improvement. Uh, now, uh, so we study area law not for it, its own sake, but rather to be able to actually 
do algorithms, so to design algorithms for finding the ground state. And, and Zef Landau, Umesh Vazirani, and Thomas Vidik have just done that. And so now, for 1D systems, we are gapped systems, because the area law is about gapped systems, we have a polynomial time algorithm. Actually, if you want to learn more about the area law, then uh, <coughs> many people have warmly recommended Isert, uh, Kramer, and Plinio's survey article. And <clears throat> I also want to mention that Sandy Rani and later Gottesman and Hastings um, uh, found, uh, so now it's, it's actually a lower bound, uh, found trade-offs between gaps and the amount of entanglement. So that was pretty much the introduction. Um, no, there is one, and, and in any case, so now I am kind of starting uh, the talk. So, um, so when the local terms commute, and this was also beautifully explained by Zeff, that in that case, the area law is actually trivial. I mean, not trivial, never say trivial, but it's very easy. And, um, and it's not only that the area law hold, holds, but also the Schmidt rank is upper bounded by D, remember there's a dimension of the locale, uh, to the size of the cut. Now, it is um, easy to show, and all of you know that if, a, if uh, like a probability distribution is on k points, then the entropy is at most log k. So here, the, uh, of course, if we know an upper bound like this on the Schmidt rank, uh, which it's kind of, it means that the, I mean, we just have this many non-zero non lambda i's, uh, and the lambda i's, of course, they form a probability distribution, then it immediately translates to the logarithm of this, that is this on the entanglement entropy. So, um, so, but, so I say that the area law holds an even stronger because it's not just stronger because of this, but it's also stronger because I did not say any grid, did I? It holds for every graph. Like uh, the size of the cut is always an upper bound on the entanglement entropy. Now, um, so one might conjecture that the area law conjecture is wrong that actually what the right conjecture would be is that whatever the local interaction graph is, then uh, the, we should have a theorem like the entanglement entropy is less or equal than the size of the cut. So D, the dimension of locale is bounded. Um, it's very important still. And I won't say again that the Hamiltonian is gapped. And so we, ho we might hope for this theorem. Now, here is a funny line, because I don't mean to say that our result is false. <laughs> but <laughs> what I mean to say is that our result is that uh, this, the above conjecture is false in general. So what it means, false in general, it means that in the non-commutative case, it fails to hold. Um, so let's see our proof. So here is the proof outline. Um, so the proof contains two <coughs> easy steps, as I say. So uh, in the first step, we are constructing a Hamiltonian in the following for the following system. So we have two locales, like these two Q-trits. Um, so they are not qubits, they are Q-trits. 
Um, and actually, I think it's important that they are cute treats. Um, and then there are these two large, like, uh, Hilbert spaces of dimension capital N, and the first in, and and so we have three interactions. The fir, uh, the left interaction acts on uh, like this huge Hilbert space, and then the left local, uh, the middle acts in between the two locals, and this acts between the well the right local and the light right large space. And so, um, and so what we are constructing is gapped Hamiltonians, actually all these interactions, they, they will be just projectors, by the way. Um, uh, so they have even bounded norm. Well, it's crucial that the middle one has bounded norm, so it has norm one, it's a projector. Um, and so it's a gap, we construct a gap Hamiltonian that this little tiny bridge just transfers a lot of entropy between the left part of the system and the right part of the system. So that's what we are constructing in the first step. And then in the second step, we are now replacing this, which you see it's, it's huge, so it's not a local Hamiltonian as in our definition in the beginning. So we are now just take this left system and transform it into a local Hamiltonian and the right system and translate it into a local Hamiltonian. But even without the second step, it's still interesting. At least Kitaev said so. And uh, uh, I think it's interesting that, without, that this little bridge, whatever is on the left and whatever is on the right, uh, can uh, transfer so much entanglement. So, um, so I am going to focus on the first step, but I am also explaining the second step. Uh, so, um, before getting into the, the, the proof, um, well, you know, when you, when you have a statement, you always have the question. So is it hard or, or where, where to put it? Um, so, of course, Frank immediately started to think that, well, I have, you know, a system. So in this system, uh, there is like an, it's like a line and there is a, an interaction with strengths one in the middle and then there are these interactions with decaying strengths on both sides. Um, now, and, and he said that that uh, has a large entropy across this, so this bridge with, inter with strengths one com uh, like transfers a lot of entropy between the two sides. However, this system is not gapped because of what I said that the strongest, that the gap can be, is upper bounded by the interaction strengths. Uh, I mean the, the minimum of the interaction strengths. Uh, so in contrast, our example, so it's very much unlike this. So my, one might conceive some other um, example than our example, but whatever example one might conceive, well, as long as the example is such that the, um, that the Hamiltonian is frustration-free, um, then it holds that actually if you multiply the left and the right by some huge numbers, then from your example, you get a new example where you get even stronger interactions, and, um, the, then, and it is still a counterexample. So you, really, you can infinitely increase the interaction strengths on the side, and that's, that's, that's for, that should hold for any uh, 
counterexample with mild restrictions that uh, these can be made huge, these interactions. In any case, so that was just if you start to think like what, like how interesting it is, or how you can, how you could possibly change this example or the proof. It's always good to look at. Um, so, um, so here now we are getting into the combinatorial details. So, may I ask the chair how much time I have? Yeah, but how much time I have? You started a little after two, so okay. twenty minutes talk. Okay, good. So um so um so I'm gonna just talk about states in this um in this system. So what is, I mean, in this Hilbert space. So what is this Hilbert space? Well, this Hilbert space is a tensor product of four Hilbert spaces. So how can I visualize like states in tensor products of four Hilbert spaces? Well, let's first try to visualize um, the, uh, states in tensor products of two Hilbert spaces. So uh, if I have a Hilbert space, I apologize. Uh, if I have a Hilbert space A and the Hilbert space B, um, and let's say it's whatever the number of dimensions, I'm uh, I mean, whatever dimension A is, I am creating so many rows in this table and and whatever dimension of B is I am creating so many columns and so I am now putting so every state in the tensor product of these two Hilbert spaces look like well uh, of, of this form so I is a basis vector of A J is a basis vector of B and then their combination comes with some coefficient and so now I am just putting that coefficient here. So what I am doing is, so that's, that's a vector. Well, I am just arranging the coefficients of, these, of this vector in a table. So if I do so, I at least get the following benefit. That if I am looking at the singular uh, at the singular values of this matrix, uh, these are the lambda i's, then I can get the entanglement entropy between A and B, and so A and B were again the two tensor components, just like this. So from the so if the state is like written in this form, that at least I can read out the entanglement entropy uh, quite easily, just by uh, finding out the singular values. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, but now I have a four dimension, uh, I mean a four, a uh, uh, tensor product of four Hilbert spaces. Well, the Actually, the, this Hilbert space is three-dimensional, and this Hilbert space is three-dimensional. And I am interested in the entropy ac across this cut. So what I am doing, well, if I am clumping together this and the big one, right, so then, um, like the basis vectors of this space are, are tuples, I, are, are, are two tuples. Uh, so. I have to pick a basis vector here, like i, and then a basis vector here, like 1 or 2 or 3. So for the left side, it's actually, if I am creating these blocks, then I can see like this component and this component. So uh, I mean, so this component corresponds to the blocks themselves, 
and then this component corresponds to where I am in this block. And likewise, for B, I can do the same, thus getting this matrix, which is like a blocked matrix, and now, like every uh, element of this Hilbert space, now it just corresponds to a table filled up with, with complex numbers, and of course the absolute value squares of these complex numbers ought to sum up to 1. And if you are looking at the intersection of, well, I am reading together I2 and 3J, what is in there, then I am getting the coefficient of I2, 3J, which is, well, it's theta. So this is how I am representing every, um, every vector in this state. And so now I am defining, which is my only task, is to define the operators uh, H, uh, HL, HM, and HR. And all these operators will be projectors. And to define a projector, all what I have to do is to define the subspace, um, their, their zero subspace. So I am defining the zero subspace um, 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 I am defining the zero subspace um, of, okay, so let me, I'm sorry, let me go back to this picture, right? So now I have to define the zero subspace of HL. So HL, where it's um, like <coughs> that Hamilton, well, the, the, well, it, it acts on an n times 3 dimensional Hilbert space, so I have to define a subspace of, of this space in order to define this, uh, this uh, projector that corresponds to this edge. And of course, in the end, when I defined it, it is going to be multiplied um, with the identity on the remaining tensor components uh, like here. So the HL prime, however, is uh, X, AX, BX, so that's a three, that's a, that's an M dime, that's a, <coughs> that's, um, well, that's an N dimensional subspace of this three N dimensional space. So for every X and A and B are just N by N matrices, uh, the first coordinate is x, I mean the first n coordinate is x, and once I define the first x co n coordinates freely, uh, it determines the, uh, the next n coordinates and the next n coordinates. And I define SR similarly, and uh, now the middle one, well it acts, it's a projector on a nine-dimensional space. So in this nine-dimensional space, I am looking at the subspace where, um, like, well, the entire nine-dimensional subspace would be just uh, one, 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 two. So each one would have just three coefficients. But now I am restricting myself the one, two, and the two, one to have the same coefficients, and the one, three, and three, one should have the same coefficients. So this way, I have defined um, these local, uh, these, these subspaces, and then when I tensor product, for instance, this one, I need to, of course, this projector, I, I, I need to tensor product it with the operator which acts as an identity on the tensor product on these two. Okay, so... Um, so, so all SM is defined, is I'm sorry? SM is the symmetric subspace? SM is not, is not the symmetric oh, subspace, SM because it would be the symmetric subspace if, so, so I only, so for instance, E23 and F32. Okay. 
So only the 1, 2, and the 2, 1, and the 3, 1, and the 1, 3 have the same coordinates. But um, in any case, um, so once I defined all these projectors, and so of course, now I have the HL, HM, and HR. So let's see what will be the ground, the ground, sp the ground space, a uh, ground minus, state. Do you Sorry. Have to be like minus those projectors? Um, I don't because the projectors are are positive. Why are you saying the minus of? Uh, oh, well, identity, uh, identity well I am sorry. They, I apologize. Uh, yeah, you are right. So, uh, what I meant is that this is the zero space. Uh, but you are absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That that was a very good comment. So I meant the zeros. These are the zero spaces. So it's actually i minus these. Um, uh, so, um, so if you look at, and I maybe, well, uh, so what does it mean that um, like I am in the first, that the first projector does not pick up any energy? It means that every column of that matrix that represents our state looks like that, that the three portions of that column must be, well, if this was x, then it should be ax and bx. So if, well, x you can think of as free, but then this should be ax and bx, which means that this matrix should look like this, that, well, if well, if this block was like a matrix X, then this has to be AX and BX. Now, what does it mean that I, I am, uh, now that this does not pick up any energy? It means that I must be in the zero subspace of this projector, which means that, well, for the row, so it should be, if it was X, it should be XA, and x b, but also it means that if it was a x, then it should be a x, and then multiplied with a, and a x multiplied with b, and then b x multiplied with a, and b x multiplied with b. Because again, the three portions should be such that if this was y, then well, I should say y star, then it should be. Um, like y star a, and it should be y star b, and that's why I get this format. So once I tell you this corner, then it actually determines the rest of the matrix. Okay, so this was the two sides, but now what does it say that the middle does not pick up any energy? So then if you, and maybe it requires a little thinking, but then you realize that what it means is that that the 1, 2 has the same coefficient as, as the 2, 1. What it means is that this block should be equal to this block. So 1, 2 should be equal to 2, 1, and this block should be equal to this one. So, I have two additional equations which say this. Now what does it leave me? I mean, what, what, what am I left with? Well, actually if A and B are just random matrices, like two random matrices, so they, they commute with X, then actually it's very easy to see that well, random matrices are commuting only with the identity, I mean two random matrices commuting only with the identity. Um, so, but I am not relying on that. I, am, I did not say what A and B were, and in a moment I will, I will tell what they are. Uh, but in any case, so, um, so certainly, the, if now I put the identity uh, there, 
that I can fill up the table and then it, that these equations hold. So this is certainly a ground state. And now I claim that not only that this is the only ground state, and again, you can think of it that so, so this might commute with, this must commute with, all, with both A and B, but also that there is nothing, there is no state which would um, just satisfies the condition anywhere near as well as this state. Uh, now, for that, I just have to specify A and B right. And it just turns out that the right condition is that when A and B form a quantum expander. So if they do, then it just happens that if something, an X, a matrix X, is very much unlike the identity that is orthogonal to the identity, which means that the, well, orthogonal, you know, in, the, in this uh, well-known orthogonality definition from mat for matrices, um, so this is the inner product. Uh, so if something is orthogonal to the identity, so it just means that the trace x is 0, right? because the y is the identity. Uh, so, so if x is such that, uh, you know, normally, well, uh, okay, so again, I apologize, I forgot, like, that A and B are unitary in the quantum expander constructions. So actually, this term has the same norm as x, and this term has the same, also the same norm. And so the chance, I mean, there is no chance that the sum, because of triangle inequality, could be greater than c. But the quantum expanderness means exactly that for every x, which is orthogonal to the identity, it's not just that it's not, it's less than 3, but it's less than 3 by a constant epsilon. And then, when I have that, then I have that actually, if a state um, is, well, expressed in this funny matrix form, um, is, um, uh, so it does not pick, uh, uh, well, actually, I am, I am putting it in the counterpositive. So if it's orthogonal to uh, this state, then it must pick up a lot of energy because if it, well, if, if it is of this form, then it does not pick up any energy from the two sides, but then it picks up any, but then it picks up a lot of energy because of the middle. And otherwise, if it's not of this form, well, roughly speaking, then it picks up a lot of energy from the two sides. So, um, so that's the construction. And to see that the entanglement entropy is large, you simply have to look at the corner. Now, you might say that maybe this corner, you know, again, this is a state, right? So, this, so, so what is the weight of this corner? Well, actually, these are unitary matrices, and we are talking about, right, this is a vector. Right? So, what is the sum of the squares of the entries of a unitary matrix? Well, actually, it's the same as the, su it's the, same as the sum of the squares of I. Every unitary matrix has the same Frobenius norm. So, uh, so actually, it's 1 over 9, the weight of this corner, and it already has large entanglement entropy. So don't, you don't even have to go any farther. OK, so actually, we are done. And it's not even evening, although it's uh, getting late. So let me just get to the ne next point. Um, which is now replace. So replace, um, so replace uh, these big bulbs uh, with those uh, uh, small um, uh, local things. So how do I do that? So actually, there is a general principle that I wanted to convey here, which is that if 
I have a projector uh, which, let's say, uh, which is with zero subspace. Uh, so with this as a zero subspace, then what I want is actually, it would be ideal, then I would have to do nothing if this projector was already local. Uh, now, okay, so is not it local? I mean, is not every projector local already? Right? So here, for instance, so on the side, um, right, we have the big bulb. Right? So that was like dimension n, and it was dimension 3. And so here we had a projector with zero subspace s with dimension with dimension n. So three so here there is a big space somewhere uh, like with n dimension and then like we have a small uh, smaller subspace with co with not co-dimension three but uh, but with like it's 3n and this was n. So is not it already local? Um, well, you know, n times 3 is 3n, so we can imagine that there is a qubit sum, a crew treat somewhere plus um, uh, some, I can make up other bits, and so I am just saying that whatever. Uh, so I can always, okay, so my, my point is that I can always write this space as S tensor some three-dimensional space, like, let's say, um, S0, <coughs> and so that's a small local, and then I am just making this local, so, so it's not the projector just always local. Then I, I all, all, all I have to say is that on this space I am just uh, I am just forcing this to be zero. I mean I, my choices are zero, one, and two. Well, what the catch? What is the catch? So a projector is local, but with respect to what? So with respect to what sites is this projector local? Well. Here and I am sorry. I just I just came up um, with this kind of clumsy challenge. But is there like anyone can um, can say which site is more most important for that site projector to be local? Well, actually, to this Q treat here. So there is a local, and I want that projector to be local to this. So while I can, I have a freedom of decomposing this anyhow, that um, when I am saying that this projector is local, it should be local with respect to this local and to some other locals. And this is my crucial locale. But in any case, um, you can prove the following theorem. That, um, that uh, every projector, um, so if I have a Hilbert space and a projector, and the Hilbert space has some predefined locales, like Q1, Q2, and so on, Qn, I can, I can make the projector local in the following way. That I have, I have to do two things. So I need to uh, add some additional bits, some ancilla bits, and second, I need to compromise with some error. And then I can create a, Hamil a local Hamiltonian on the prescribed locals in such a way that 
this Hamiltonian is gonna at the, the ground subspace of this Hamiltonian is gonna be spanned uh, it's, it's gonna be well kind of like this with the additional things around which is where we are in a bigger space so here is the what we want but unfortunately there is something around but the good news is that we are tensoring it with a constant fixed vector and there is some error and um, the way how you are doing it um, and I see that my time is up so let me just uh, <coughs> say it in one sentence that we are just building a quantum computer that just simply turns this uh, uh, space into uh, or more precisely like we fix some locals and so the, we take the tensor product on the rest which is like a subspace of hopefully uh, I mean we are making it the same dimension as this and then we are just turning it in with a unitary and we compute this transformation with this unitary trans with, with the unitary um, uh, so we compute this unitary with a, uh, with a, a quantum circuit and then we apply Kitaev construction to get the Hamiltonian and the very important caveat is that in order to make sure that the final state that is when we are in S is prominent is that we just let the uh, quantum uh, the, the quantum circuit just stay where it is in the end for a long time and so after we did that we managed to turn this um, uh, into a local system and so we accomplished what we wanted um, so at this point uh, let me finish my talk and you can read the open questions but you can also ask if um, if um, you know what I mean on these on these questions under these questions so thank you very much Yes. Yeah, so I think that's a very good question. Yeah, uh, absolutely. No, you are, it's a very it's an excellent question and the answer is that I believe that yes. I believe that yes, but Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there ought to be and um, maybe it's it's um, actually some nice cool graph theoretic measure rather than some crazy and then and then it should or could Oh, actually, no, I do. What about um, so in terms of replacing with qubits? Uh, can you can you use a bunch of qubits, maybe not on a line, but in some two uh, D arrangement or some something like this, uh, where you use you use gadgets basically? You know, if we have these these sort of gadget constructions with uh, where with with the what do you want to accomplish with that? Just replacing the cube trick with qubits. Um, yeah, but. Um, so, so this, well, of course, you can replace it with two qubits. Yeah. Right? So the gadget would contain, well, that you could easily do, but that the connection would be just between two qubits, just a single bridge between two qubits. Right. So then you get a four. Then your thing becomes a four qubit term, but then you could use gadgets to turn that into a bunch of two qubit terms. Well, I. I Okay, so so what would be your pick? So it would be this picture that this is a qubit. This is a qubit. So it just a single bit. I, oh no, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't because, be because because this is what is the question whether you can do it or not. I see. Yeah. And actually, I believe that you cannot do it. And there is 
So it's an algebraic question. Essentially, it's an interesting algebraic question. I see. It's related to the issue, to the fact you can't have an expander just with two. Yeah, yeah. You cannot have any expander with just with just one edge or something. Yeah. So that's actually that also shows that that something somewhat non-trivial is going on because it's three. Maybe something I didn't understand in the earlier part here, we're comparing to this uh, construction with geometric uh, decreasing strengths. And, but then you said, well, the, uh, the constructions can only can always be scaled up. Um, well, but then the middle one also scales up, and you want the middle one, the middle interaction strengths to be constant. Saying there was land to land, or probably you could just scale up the size, maybe it was You cannot, I mean, this, this, you mean just multiply everything with the large? Well, what thing? Was the state, there was a statement about scaling by lambda and lambda front, and maybe what was that statement? You mean you are talking about Frank's example? Yeah. yeah. Well, how would you scale it up? I mean, no, if no, you, you stated that for any construction you could scale by lambda and lambda front, maybe I didn't understand that. No, 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 that was. In any construction which works, so Frank's construction does not work. That's why you cannot scale it up because it does not have a constant gap. Wait, why? Why should any working construction have that property? Well, because then you are just adding energy. Uh, so if it's if the ground state is unfrustrated, okay. then. Uh, you are just adding energy to the size, but since everything is unfrustrated, then it's the ground state in, still in stays Frank's zero. The gap obviously just increases. So in Frank's, it's frustrated. Yeah. Sorry. In Frank's, it's frustrated. It's if the two sides are unfrustrated, but the middle is not, then it's uh, that the, altogether it's not. Then it's still then you can still scale it up, which is the case in our construction. Uh, by the way, I, I should have credited uh, Daniel for creating gadgets which, large, which turns a single edge with large interaction strengths into, um, into a, a local with small interaction strengths. Who, who is your quarter? You don't, it's sitting there, and we probably will make a discussion on these gadgets. Like sometime okay, later. that's great. So, thank you. Yeah? <coughs> Do you have any feeling that uh, your uh, the gap of your Hamiltonian is stable under these uh, perturbations? Say if you if your Hamiltonian is a sum of weak of perturbation, if it's still there. Well, I think the so the sides the sides should so I think it should be stable. Uh, um, so in particular, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I don't know. I I can't. Um, I, I should think about it, but I think it should be stable. Uh, and I am using some kind of stability in the proof. Right. Any more questions? Um, so, is your Hamiltonian uh, stochastic, or is it so, does it have a side problem? Well, I, I don't think it's stochastic, but I don't know what. I mean, I once I read. And it doesn't strike me as that, but I forgot the definition of stochastic. Okay. So, I mean, do the, do all, are all the amplitudes in the ground state positive in what? So if it's stochastic, all the amplitudes in the ground state are positive from zero in the computational basis. Yeah, probably not. Then. A and B are general unitary, so it won't be stop a stochastic yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker and return to the 30.